so that's a little bit of a school. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, I was going to put one more picture and I forgot. Sorry. The the just ignore the, the grassy picture that is not Fort Hope, um, but you can see an inside of the classroom, and that was my classroom my first year. And then uh, the display uh, on the bottom is the uh, our graduation uh, display that we had for this this past year for our grade eights and our senior kindergarten students. So that's just a little bit inside the school. This was um, Leo in my house for the last two years. Um, the dog on the porch is ours. The other two are, are, um, are the dogs who basically are camped out at our house all the time. Um, dogs are very free range there. So it's very different for our dog being in the city, um, being on a leash, because normally we just open the door and out he goes and that's it. But that's the outside of our house. The other two pictures, because our house was too messy on the inside, I just used some stock pictures uh, from Teach for Canada because they do have a manual that they give to teachers going up. So these are some a little bit nicer inside views of the of the houses. Um, teachers who go into the community uh, stay in what are called teacherages, um, and they we rent them for uh, for the time that we are there. Um, there's different units. There's one bedroom units, there's two bedroom units, there's three bedroom units. Sometimes you have to share um, with, with another uh, teacher that's coming in. They're just in the process of building uh, an eight plex, uh, which will be eight single units, I believe. Um, and so that's happening right now. We'll see if it's done by the time we get back. And our units are um, heated by uh, like a, a gas, uh, furnace, uh, but most of the houses in the community are uh, from wood stoves. So when when the propane plane doesn't come in, then we don't necessarily have heat. Um, and it's yeah, it can get cold. So this is just a few things of uh, what we do in the summertime or what I like to do in the summertime. Leo has a, a boat. Uh, so we tend to go out fishing a lot. That's one of the walleye that I caught. Um, and then often we'll do some shore lunches where you get together with some other people. You meet on an island, you you know fillet your fish, you have a, a fish fry kind of on the island and then um, just hang out for the day. So it's a fun way to kind of get away from, from the community and be out on the land, which is really nice. Um, and the swimming bear picture was taken from uh, when we were on the boat, uh, I believe it was last year, and it just swam right in front of our boat uh, as we were traveling along. <laughs> this is some winter pictures. So again, dogs are very free range. This is our kind of crew that we walk with on the lake. We're out walking on the lake. Um, one of the temperatures was negative, felt like negative 47. We have a lot of cold days in the community. Um, it can get very, very cold for the school. The school will close uh, when it's negative 40 or below. And uh, so we do tend to have a number of closures uh, in the winter because it's just simply too cold. However, as you can see from the other picture, we do have an outdoor ice rink. And when the school is closed, that's where the kids go. They go to the outdoor ice rink because there is no school. So for them, the cold is, it's never too cold. So it's people that are not used to the cold where it's too cold. And then there's just some more winter pictures. So inside of the arena, that's the Res Girls hockey team uh, that's playing. It's a girls hockey team that um, I'm the general manager for and Leo helped found that team. It's an all girls, girls team. And there's another picture of us walking on the lake. And then you can see we're in a vehicle in the bottom picture and that's us driving across the lake uh, on the winter road. Um, the winter road is open depending on the year, sometimes it, you're lucky and it can be open from the beginning of January to March. Other years, it's very, very short, can be only four weeks, um, but a lot of supplies come into the community via the winter road. So you always hope for a really cold winter for supplies, but not a cold winter for yourself because <laughs> it gets really cold. Um, 
but it is fun. Uh, I've been on the winter road a few times now to another neighboring community in Ashkandiga. We went to play bingo one time and that was about a five hour drive, three hour drive. Uh, and then another time we drove to Dryden, which was at like five to felt like 12 hour drive because you're going really slow. Uh, and the last picture I wanted to show, this is the, um, the water treatment plant. I know we get a lot of questions about um, you know, water. And as, uh, as Stephen mentioned, there is uh, a boil water advisory in the community, which has been there since August 2001, but it's probably earlier than that. Um, and in November 2019, the plant was finished. Um, finished, I say in quotations, uh, because it still doesn't work. So. Uh, we still do not, you cannot drink water from the tap. Um, we have this beautiful building um, and I'm sure there's lovely, I've never been inside of it, but there's all of the workings of a, of a water treatment plant, but we still have to haul water uh, from reverse osmosis machines in the community. The school has two um, and then the rest of the community has three, I believe, um, or at least two for sure. Uh, three, I think there's one in the nursing station, um, but you basically you take your jugs and in the winter it's great you put it on a sled and you just pull it in the summer it's a little harder, unless you have a wagon, and you just fill your jugs and you bring them home and that's that's what you use um, for your drinking and cooking and and everything. And I think that is the end of what I had to say so that's. That's just a little bit about what it looks like for those who have never seen a First Nation community. Um, I forgot to mention it is an Ojibwe community. So um, the main language spoken there is English, but there are still a number of elders and Leo, um, not saying that Leo's an elder, but Leo does speak Ojibwe. <laughs> I'm gonna say mostly elders, but Leo speaks Ojibwe as well. Um, uh, and at the school, the kids get instead of uh, French immersion, which, you know, in most other places they would get as their, uh, their language up there, it's native, it's, they get Ojibwe classes every day. So that's, um, that's sort of a little bit about it from my perspective. Um, I don't know if you wanted to do Leo next and then do questions or how you wanted to proceed from there. Um, why don't we uh, do questions now uh, for a little while and then we can get on to Leo right after that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to remove your spotlight so I can see everybody because I need to be able to you know, the hands go up. So what I'll suggest is um, if you put your hand up like literally or with the little, you know, sign thing, um, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you, oh, okay, you can speak. So please don't speak unless I've said that you can speak. And if I'm missing you, uh, Amanda, if you can give me a heads up or just uh, put something in the chat. Okay, so John Elder, you can go first. You'll have to unmute yourself, though. Make sure you unmute yourself. Hi, Uncle Johnny. <laughs> I was just going to suggest that Allison might like to comment on how she organized the ladies to play hockey up there who had never had access to it before, and a little bit of how that developed, because the end result was she had a much more responsive group of kids. Sure. Um, so, um, so as my uncle said, um, I was uh, very fortunate to be involved in in helping to. I didn't help start the team. Um, that team was started by one of my colleagues, actually, or one of my friends who uh, teach for Canada. We went up the same year uh, in 2016, and she was a hockey player, and she had some girls uh, come to her door and ask to start a hockey team. There was no organized sport for girls up there and they wanted to play hockey just like the boys so she um, enlisted the help of, of Leo much to his uh, many times saying no um, to put a hockey team together and I sort of tagged along at the end of maybe their first year because many of the girls on the team were in my class and since I taught grade five and the kids were mainly grade six grade five grade seven uh, age. And so I started to work with the team. And then uh, the, se the second year of the team, um, I became the general manager. And so the girls um, 
had to try out for the team. They had to come to practices uh, three days a week. We would do dry land training when there was no uh, ice available because we don't have, we have natural ice up there. So until it gets cold, we can't have any ice. And so we would do dry land training in the gym. And then uh, once we had uh, some ice, some of them would just skate on the lake as soon as it's frozen. And you'll see little skating rinks kind of crop up all over the place. But we had, uh, we have, we do have an indoor uh, uh, rink there. And once that was flooded, which was around January, then we would start to have practices. Um, and it was really a way for, for the girls to have an outlet. Um, because there was no organized sport, they had never played on a team before. So having that opportunity for leadership roles, um, it really improved their confidence. A lot of the girls had a lot of self-confidence uh, issues and um, self-esteem was, was also in play. And it really kind of built them up and it gave them a purpose and it gave them, um, you know, just, just something to do, which, which was just for them. And, uh, but one of the rules of being on the team is that you had to go to school every day. And um, that was a contract. We made the girls sign a contract and um, that was part of being on the team. And they had chances if they, you know, skip practices without letting us know. And, you know, that, that, um, that was all part of it. And it really uh, improved their uh, attendance at school. Uh, it was really great to see last last year, um, ooh, how many of them were girls? Most of the girls I would say that were on the team, actually all of the girls that were on the team uh, graduated from grade eight, which, which was a huge accomplishment. We had a really big graduating class. And we also had the opportunity to take them on some really exciting trips. We took them to Ottawa to play. We took them to Kingston to play. And uh, we also uh, were very fortunate uh, to be given uh, equipment through the National Hockey League Players Association and also Mitch Marner Assist Fund. And they funded two girls to come to Toronto uh, to see a Leafs game and meet Mitch Marner uh, as well. So they've had some really exciting opportunities uh, come out from hockey. And it was really sad that we, we weren't able to play hockey this year, but they're already, they've, they've been bugging me since last September. When can we start hockey? <laughs> so it was a really great thing. And now there's the next group of girls that are, um, that are coming along that were maybe in grade two, grade three at the time when the team started and now they're grade five, grade six, and they're they're ready to play. And most of the girls that were on the team are now in high school. So it, it was a really great, great, great project and, and we're hoping to continue it. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. Um, Annie has asked, uh, what do you do as a teacher over the summer? Um, well, uh, myself, because my family lives in Toronto, I, I come home, <laughs> I come home and visit my, my parents and my sister. Um, I, I do try to do some courses, um, like AQ courses, um, and just kind of get my, my city fix before, before going back up, do my shopping things that I can't get up there. Uh, I, I didn't mention, we only have two stores up there. Um, so everything Basically, it's food and and things that you would need for hunting, fishing, um, you know, car maintenance. There's a tiny bit of clothing, but it's very limited to what you can get. So everything has to be flown in, and many people rely on leaving the community to do their shopping. Um, so I also take advantage of that during the summer. Steve, you're muted. Yep. <laughs> I can say that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> for those of you who can't read lips, what I was saying was that um, uh, that was a chat question. So now I'd like to go to a live question. So uh, Judy Farwell, would you like to ask a question? Remember to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, two, two little ones. Um, where do they go to high school after they graduate from your school? So because we don't have a high school, uh, the students have to uh, apply first for funding in order to go out to high school. Um, and they can choose wherever they would, they would like to go. Um, many, many do go to Thunder Bay because they will have family in Thunder Bay because they will need to be billeted 
Um, so they will go out to Thunder Bay, but we've had kids go um, to Kingston. We've had kids go to uh, Guelph area. We've had, you know, they, they can choose where, where they wish to go, um, but it, it's a matter of will they have a billeting family uh, there. So they're, you know, they, most of them will do grade nine in the community and then they leave in grade 10. So it's, what are they, 15 when they're leaving? So it's, it's pretty young. That's great, encouraging. And um, when they were playing hockey down here, I heard, I read that one team was very generous with and welcoming and another team was not so kind to them. And I wonder how the girls handled that situation. Um, so it was definitely, I think, that incident was perhaps in um, in Thunder Bay. That was the first year they went out. I wasn't with the team at the time, so I can't really speak about that um, that particular incident. But there is um, unfortunately a lot of racism in in Thunder Bay, um, and so it's it's quite common that um, there will be things that will happen uh, in Thunder Bay. There's been a lot of you know missing missing kids in Thunder Bay. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a scary place. Um, the girls, I think, again, I wasn't there for that incident. Um, so I can't really, I can't really speak about it. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's disheartening for them. They don't, they don't like to see it. And, and it's, it's hard too coming from such a small place and you go to a, such a big place and um, not to be welcomed is, is really, is really unfortunate and sad. Thank you. Okay, now um, a, a bunch of people have asked in the chat a question, which I suspect other people also want to ask, why doesn't the water treatment plan work? <laughs> um, I, I wish I had an answer for that. Um, Leo can give you a nice, a nice answer for that. Actually, interestingly enough, I went on the um, Indigenous Services Canada website today because I was just really curious. That's, uh, you know, what they had to say about it. And updated as of May uh, 2021, they said that the plant had been completed uh, in November 2019 and that the water testing met all requirements um, but living in the community, I can tell you that it doesn't work and it is not working. You cannot drink the water from the tap. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what the delay is. I don't know why it is not working. I don't know why it cannot work. I know there are issues also with the size of the community and um, just the general sewage system and the the piping and everything because it's not big enough for the actual size of the community because it is expanding so there are issues there as well but i'm not an engineer so i cannot tell you exactly why it's not working all i can tell you is that it does not work and that i do haul my water um, on a weekly basis um, someone has asked what contaminates the water like can you just draw wa fresh water out of the lake and drink it or um, no, <laughs> you still need to boil it. Uh, some people will, uh, they'll go to kind of more spring areas, uh, for, for the water, like, uh, but there's still various bacteria and, and things in the water that just make it not, um, not drinkable. Okay. Thanks. Um, now, uh, I'm, what I would suggest is that I do we do three more questions and then we should let Leo talk, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, Gary's had her hand up for a while, I think, Stephen. Sorry, who? Gary's had her hand up for a yeah. while. So, Jerry, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. And um, thanks very much for coming to talk to us. That's wonderful. Um, how easy was it for you to integrate and to adapt into your new community? And uh, how and were you welcome? Um, I was very welcomed, um, but I have to admit that it was not easy my very first year. Um, I was a brand new teacher. Uh, it was my very first year teaching, even though I was a bit older, I wasn't fresh out of fresh out of school like like some. Um, 
And in Jan or in December, no, November, which when the report card season came around the first time, I was ready to go home. I was done. I was not, I was not um, having a good go of it, and I wanted to leave. And and I had you know very strong feelings about leaving. Um, in terms of welcoming, I, the community itself is is very welcoming. Um, everyone is is very friendly. Um, and actually, that's that's how I met Leo. I uh, my tutor escort or my TA in my classroom uh, was a volleyball player, and she suggested that I come out and play volleyball. And because I had played volleyball for many years before going, and so I did. Uh, and that's that's actually where where I met Leo. And um, he has a very very large family who is also very welcoming. Um, and I think you know having that extra. Um, encouragement from them definitely uh, made it so that I stayed. Um, but it's one of those things, the more you uh, you get yourself out there and you participate in activities, whether it's uh, a flea market or, you know, even helping out with a funeral or um, going out to play a sport. I'm not a hockey player. I help, you know, help the, organize the hockey, but I don't play hockey. Uh, so that wasn't going to be for me. But um, the, the volleyball is something that I enjoy. And so that really um, helped me kind of meet some more people that I wouldn't have met necessarily at the school. And um, definitely meeting Leo was a big, a big plus for, well <laughs> for done, keeping Leo. me coming back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm gonna ask Laura Lane and then owner's iPhone, otherwise known as Isabel, and then we're gonna go to Leo. So Laura Lane first. I want to know where you get your food. Is it all flown in? Uh, I know you said you catch fish. Uh, are there game from hunting? Uh, do you grow any vegetables in the summer? Do you have long enough season for that? So what do you eat? Yeah, great question. So we have two stores. So they have a lot of um, meats and dry goods that you can uh, get and some fruits and veggies as well. Uh, it's very expensive, I find, uh, buying it from the store. Uh, so I tend to do my my shopping before going, just you know, pack it up in bins and get it uh, get it shipped in. But there is uh, definitely still fishing. There's hunting. So moose is a big thing that people hunt. Um, up there, I mean, it's not like an everyday occurrence where someone's someone's getting a moose, but it's a big uh, it's a big deal when somebody does get a moose. Um, the community sort of comes, well, not the whole community, but that family maybe comes together um, to to help butcher it and then package it up, and then a lot of it is is distributed um, to uh, to different families. Um, I have had the opportunity to butcher a moose. That was my, <laughs> when I showed up at one of uh, at Leo's mom's house one day and, and she said, come here. And they sat me down, they gave me a knife, they stuck a big moose leg in front of me and said, go. And that was my, <laughs> that was my introduction to, um, to butchering a moose and she said just just follow me kind of thing and I didn't really know what I was doing but um, it is delicious if, if you've never had moose it's it's delicious. Um, there's geese and ducks that also um, are hunted but I would say the bulk of the food that people eat is not not off of the land. Um, they do have a garden which they have started about three years ago. It's growing but it's mostly like uh, four years ago they started. Um, mostly root vegetables. Um, I think they have a very short season for maybe tomatoes and I think I saw some strawberries. Um, but it's it is expanding, but it is a very short growing season. So um, but it is something they are they are doing in the community, which is great. Does that answer all your questions? <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. And uh, Isabel, last question before we go to Lido. Yeah, two, uh, two small ones. Uh, one, do you have internet access? And two, is it possible to be a vegetarian there? Ooh, good questions. Um, yes, we do have internet access there. Um, it, up until I would say right before we left, uh, just this past summer, um, it, it we have ExploreNet, which is okay. Um, it's not the best. Uh, certainly doing things like Zoom are not always very reliable. Um, they did have sort of like a dial up kind of local community internet as well. Uh, but we are getting um, satellite 
uh, internet, which is coming in care of Elon Musk and uh, the, the Starlink. So they had just set up one of the dishes before we left. And uh, so that's going to, I think, provide a lot more opportunities um, because we didn't have internet school or anything like that this past year because we just the families just don't have access to it. Um, and your second question about being a vegetarian, it is possible, but you have to plan and bring your own, a lot of your own food, I would say. Um, we do have fruit and veggie markets. Um, the care of, I think it's the Diabetes Association does once a month, or they were trying to do it once every month where they would fly in just fruits and vegetables. And then you could go and you could purchase them. And it was like a very reasonable price. Obviously with COVID that didn't happen, um, but we did get a number of uh, food boxes delivered um, to houses this year. They, they, you know, the COVID money was spent by various organizations in the community on making sure that the, the community was eating and having food. So um it is possible but it's it you need to be a planner if you're not a very good planner then you can't just necessarily pick up and go to the store and decide i'm gonna eat you know this today because it might not be there can i sneak in a quick last question sorry how what's the alcohol situation in the community um it is a dry reserve uh so it there is there's no I'm not going to say there's no alcohol in the community, but it's not um, it's not legally in the community if it's if it's there. So, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, cool. So um, I would like to now hand the floor over to Leo. Uh, Leo, you'll have to unmute yourself, and I'm going to spotlight you so everybody can see you. There you go. Okay, you're on. Um, so you just need to unmute yourself. Leo. There we go. Yeah, unmute. For you get them, we all can be in the case. I must go see each page. You go, can I be as good as my school? See, give me the go. I ain't doing G. I've met them. Het is een gewissing, voor hoop is niet gaat ik. Niet in de dezelfde. My name is Leo Adelkamp. My name is man that stands strong. I'm from Edmonton, where the water reverses in the springtime from the river, the Albany River. That's what it means the water that reverses into the lake and goes back out into the Albany River. That's what it means, the reversing river people. That's what Admetung means. Um, Fort Hope is a, a settlement that uh, the fur trade, the Hudson Bay made about west of the lake. So that's Fort Hope where uh, Admetung, uh, there used to be a, a Catholic church, uh, and uh, Hudson Bay and an Anglican church in that area. So, and they lived across the, across the lake there from the churches and the store, <clears throat> the trading post, it was called Fort Hope. Um, that's where uh, the people that are running the Hudson Bay and uh, all that would uh, live in that fort. That's east of, uh, of if you wanna bring up that map, does it show the map there? No way. Anyways, <clears throat> but the community is uh, moved uh, to where uh, we are now. Um, it's a uh, very hard living there for uh, visitors and people that are from not from the community. So the community tends to go and introduce themselves and help them out and try to make them as comfortable as they can as a uh, they are helping our community members with different issues in the community. Um, <clears throat> I uh, left uh, I left Abmatung um, to go to high school. Um, I left when I was 15 years old. Uh, I came back from the bush with my uh, my grandparents and uh, registered for school. 
re-register and they told me, uh, you're leaving in two weeks, you're going to Thunder Bay for high school. And that was for grade nine. I used to live in a bush, uh, it's called Bush Town, where my uh, mom's side would go out hunting and living. <clears throat> and I lived there since I was uh, about six years old. My parents used to take me out there with my grandparents, me and my brother. And that's where I lived all my life and, uh, until I went to high school. Two weeks later, I was being flown out to uh, Thunder Bay to uh, go to high school. Um, it was very scary and very coming out of the bush and going right into the city. That was a really big change. Um, I've also uh, worked in the community. Um, I've also worked with uh, OPP. OPP I worked with for uh, two years. Then I worked with the National Bay State Police Service. That's NAPS, we call now. I've worked with them for, uh, I think, eight years. I, uh, I went to uh, most of the calls with, uh, with the police officer to de-escalate the, uh, the situation. <clears throat> I had no gun, no vest, nothing like that. I was just supposed to go in there and talk down uh, whoever was up in roar. But uh, most of the time we had no incidents, once or twice, but nothing. Sorry, getting it back feeded just close to. Anyways, uh, that's one of the things I did. I also worked with uh, Child and Family Services. Uh, I did not believe in that. Um, taking kids away from the community and as a social worker and a child care worker, I did that for uh, three and a half years and I did not believe in taking the kids out of the community and bringing them down south. And I believe that uh, the kids belong with their parents and, you know, helping parents and figuring out that that was another job I did. <clears throat> uh, now I work at the school. I've been there for 11 years. I, I, uh, I, uh, I do acting principal, I do uh, acting vice principal, I do uh, teaching, I do native language teaching, I do gym, I do, uh, I do almost everything in the school. I even drive the bus for the kids, uh, help them uh, when we don't have a bus driver. But my main title is uh, I'm a social counselor. I help kids. Um, the most kids I worked with was 429, um, 429 registered at one year and I was alone, something new and big. Uh, <clears throat> I went and got my social degree at uh, Laurentian University in uh, Sudbury. And uh, the thing I talk about with the kids is education got us into this. And I tell them education will get you out. I always tell the kids that, you know, to uh, encourage them about uh, the stuff that we talk about in the school, like the older grades, about this shirt that I'm wearing and, and what it means when we talk about it. Um, I also go hunting. I love hunting. I love fishing. <clears throat> I had uh, one teacher come to me and said, you know, this student is uh, drawing, shooting and cutting and, you know, like he was curious and he's like, why is a student, you know, you need to talk to the student. And I was like, yeah, his dad killed a moose last weekend and, uh, you know, we teach the kids. It's not the game related stuff. I said, it's how it is up here, that's that's how it works, you know. I was starting to cut a moose at nine years old. My grandpa was teaching me how to cut it, how to cut a male and a female in different ways, how to cut fish, you know, like. I was also a guide for 22 years at Memeniska Lake. Uh, I worked there for 22 years. I started when I was 14 years old and that's how I started to work with people uh, from all over the world. Um, 
people from New Zealand, Asia, uh, you know, like Germany, France, all those places. I met all these different people from different places in the States, um, <clears throat> even in Canada, even in Toronto, I uh, met people. And that's how I started to, to talk about where I'm from and what I do and my family. <clears throat> But the community itself, uh, uh, I worked as, uh, uh, when I was working with police, uh, I left the police force because of all the suicide and the stuff that happens and suicide and trauma that you go to. I didn't want to reach that point, so I left and uh, I said I had to start somewhere where you know, like, so I went to the school after I left that place. Um, so that got me moving after that and thinking about the kids and how to help the kids and, you know, take them in different directions and help them understand, that, you know, there's more in life. But uh, the healthcare is just one of the scariest things to go through. Um, Allison will tell you she was my escort one time and uh, and she couldn't believe the system that we have and how it works and the paperwork it takes to uh, to see a doctor to see a dentist to see an eye doctor it takes so much effort and you have to leave the community again even uh, for education you know like like i said it's just a scary moment but at 15 years old until, uh, until you reach uh, university, you can go back. But most people that do reach university don't go back. You know, they stay out and they have the opportunity. <clears throat> and the, like she said about the drinking water, you know, that's been going on for more than 25 years. They say 25 years to 22 years, but it's not. I am now, uh, 39 years old and still. But we do use fresh water from uh, the springs, you know, like, you know, you just drink out of that. And, or we go camping uh, back in the community there where we go hunting, where we have set up uh, our campsites. Uh, we go to the springs and that's where we get water. We don't even boil it. We just drink right out of the cup and stuff like that what Allison was talking about. <clears throat> and the services, uh, I work with mental health services and the services there. I mean, you got 1,550 people there and there's only nine. The most, um, the least you'll have is five, uh, five mental health workers to work with the whole community. And uh, most of the time, um, I'm volunteering my time to help with other people, with other organizations in the community for mental health. And this year was a big challenge due to the COVID. And uh, we couldn't fly in nobody. We couldn't do nothing. We had to rely on ourselves <clears throat> to do the mental health part. Um, the other issue is uh, suicide, you know, like, it's just incredibly scary for one suicide affects the whole community. Even a, a natural death affects the whole community because it's somebody's grandpa, somebody's dad, somebody's head. It goes right down the line and everybody is, is connected to that person. So, you know, it's hard for somebody to forget, especially a community when they say, forget this and that. Uh, my uh, my parents and my grandparents were all survivors of a residential school. Um, and that's what we have gone to. Um, myself, I'm a survivor of day school. Uh, that's another lawsuit we have with the, the government. And I've applied two years ago, and they've been telling me that you will be compensated and it's been two years now. So there's a whole mess of other 
lawsuits with the Canadian government that most people don't hear about. And day school is one of them, and that's where I came in. <clears throat> and some of the stuff that were happening in day school, nobody knows about that it's not mentioned about. You know, that's the part I grew up in uh, during the 70s and 90s. Um, it was like residential school, but lived in the same community in different atmosphere. Um, we still have uh, further north, uh, further north of where we live, um, like she said, like Fort Severn, something like that. They still won't have powwows. They still won't allow the drum in the community, They're not allowed to dance. You know, the churches up there still don't allow stuff like that. In our community, I think was one of the first ones to bring the drum back into a uh, Northern Ontario, I think it was one of our communities that were the first one to have internet, to have a phone, to have um, a TV, a cable TV, and, you know, all the stuff that communities are having now, uh, you know, because Abmatung is connected to all the other communities. Um, they came from Abmatung and they went off. As a residential school started, they went to different places to get away and uh, find new things. But this is, this is how we are, this is how we are uh, identified by the Canadian government. This is called a status card. This is what they identify us with. Um, you know, they think it's tax free, but you pay more than tax when you live up north, you know, like, a jug of milk down here was five bucks. You can pay twenty-one dollars. That's double, triple, even everything that you buy. But I do take advantage of this when I'm down here and I go shopping. But uh, that's how you identify. <clears throat> Back in the day, this was used to identify where you were, what you were doing, how much kids you had, and you know why aren't they in school? Like this was used for identification for your community. Um, for your treaty money, you had to identify yourself for this. And your treaty money was $4. Back in the day, that would buy your flour, sugar, all the stuff that you need to go out in the land. But now $4 is, and this is what you use to get your $4 to identify yourself. And I tell the kids to go get their $4, not to forget the history, not to forget what the treaty was signed. And that's another thing that I went to learn in, uh, when I went to university in Lauritian was uh, the treaty and what the treaty is doing and what the treaty does. It has its up and downs, but mostly down. And uh, that's about it. And uh, so much more to talk about. There's so much things that, you know, it may seem all bad, you know, like like a guy I was watching, I've been here a couple of weeks now, and the guy was leaving his uh, sprinkler on and it splashed me and it, I taste the water and it tastes like when I drink water here, it doesn't taste the same as home because there's so much chlorine in our water to take out all the bacteria. That's what, uh, that's why we don't drink the water is the chlorine that's put in it. Um, and the size of the community, that's how much chlorine they put in to the water so that we have water. But uh, that's how uh, it is, that's how it works. Uh, it's how uh, the system goes into the communities, how much water goes in. So they measure it by the chlorine and then it contaminates the water more. Um, so that's why we, uh, I was telling uh, my mom, I'm gonna go down and drink out of the tap. And I, when I brought the girls hockey team, they were all scared to drink from the tap when we were down in Thunder Bay, Ottawa. I had to literally turn on the tap and 
showed them that you can drink water down here, like, and they thought I was going to get sick or they were going to get sick. So, sorry, my dog is bumping me. Thank you, Leo. Um, why don't, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to open it up for questions because I suspect people have lots of questions. Um, sure. So, uh, Robert, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I'm actually going to ask um, two short political science questions, if you will. Um, the first one is, um, how would things be different if the if Indigenous peoples were given um, self self governance under um, the constitutional reform proposals back in 1987 and 1992? And secondly, um, Leo, since you used to work for the police service and for social services agencies, um, do you mind can ask um, what's the current um, socioeconomic uh, situation, not only in your community, but other indigenous communities um, with regards to things such as um, such as crime, child welfare, um, economic, uh, economic development with regards to the ring of fire um, uh, mining proposal. I don't know if it goes that far north. So yeah, those are the two questions I have. Thank you in advance. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Leo. Okay. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, the services that we do have right now is because of COVID. You know, we were starting to build a service before COVID came in. Uh, right now, it's just us and, and Dalton and other services have come up and they have to do the whole protocols to come to the community and they come for two weeks and they leave for two weeks and they come back for two weeks. Now we're at that point where it's opening up a little bit, but the crime is, is survival, you know, like um, it's uh, probably about 80% unemployed up there and the cost that you have to pay you know is astounding it's uh, you know it just leads people into crime it's just uh, it's so scary some um, when you think about it but the ring of fire i think is the reason why all of this is happening the ring of fire is supposed to bring us 85 years of mining, but the community doesn't want the ring of fire. You know, it could bring so much, so much the ring of fire, but Doug Ford hasn't bring up his bulldozer yet and made a road yet. And he's sworn that he's going to make a, a road up there and get it going. And I think that's why he said, and they, they've said, you know, uh, there's uh, 25 only communities that were getting their water. And we said no to the ring of fire. And they said, oh, you were 27 to get your, I think that gave us a hint of the politics, like open up your mine and we'll give you water. That's what it sounded like to us when we were sitting in a meeting with other communities uh, there's uh, nine other communities that are up there with us and we keep saying no to the ring of fire and funding has gone down for school, funding has gone down for health care, funding has gone down for mental health, you know, like, I have a feeling that's where it's coming from because we're not saying yes to what they're talking about. Thank you. Um, okay, does anyone else have a question? I'm looking for raised hands, real ones or cartoon ones. Uh, John Lippart. Thank you. Uh, I'm mute. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I'm just wondering what other possible economic activity might be, yeah, be might be able to be developed. 
Um, we unemployment is scary, but what else? Yeah. What are people going to do? Uh, people, we were going to do. Uh, there was uh, logging. There was logging, there was tourism, there was all this stuff all being lined up uh, without the mine. Um, but uh, all this stuff just took a hold and everything because of COVID, like it was just starting to roll and things were starting to come, but then COVID came and pretty pushed us back again. Okay. Like, I, like I was telling my, uh, my mother-in-law Sue there, when you go into the community, it's like you're going back into the 90s. And then when you leave the community, come down to Toronto, it's like you're back in 2000. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a gap. There's a gap there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. One other question, if I may. have Of, of the young kids that have graduated from high school, uh, have have many of them been had good successful careers? I mean, successful that they are uh, they have employment and they're self sustaining. That is why there's twenty one hundred officer members. The ones that succeed stay in Toronto, stay in Thunder Bay, stay in Kingston. They don't come back to the community. You know. You said twenty one hundred. Yep. From Moncton, uh, Moncton, New Brunswick, to uh, to uh, Saskatchewan, we have community members all across Canada that are from our community. Oh, uh, that are Ojibwe. Yes. Yeah. yeah, just in one nation. Yeah, but the community itself, it you know, most of the people are on uh, Ontario Works, where you uh, they give you money. Yeah. Right. And, does that, so, does that affect your population, the demographic the demographics from children, teens, and on up? Oh, yes. We're the fastest growing uh, young community in Northern Ontario. Like our community is mostly probably range from uh, 18 to uh, 40 right now. Okay. That's the highest population. So how large are the families? Uh, oh. uh, go from probably two to eight in a family. Okay. And, that, and housing is another yeah. big issue. Yeah. Housing is another big issue that we have. Overcrowded people leave. Could you explain mm -hmm. actually how housing works, Leo? Because I think, you know, we're used to thinking that if there's 300 houses in a community, that means there's 300 homeowners and, you know, you, you decide to move, you sell your house, you go somewhere else, but it doesn't work that way on reserves exactly, right? No. So what happens is uh, <clears throat> you're uh, given a house and uh, some houses. Oh, wait, wait, you muted yourself somehow. Sorry, can you un? There we go. Thank you. Sorry, I don't need to talk too much. Um, um, <clears throat> housing is the uh, you apply for a house. Sometimes they'll give you a house and you uh, pay to own it, or uh, the older houses they give you to uh, own. But most families that do have kids leaving at 15 to 16, 18 go with their kids to high school. They they pack up the whole family and they give up their house and somebody else moves in there. And it, and uh, when I applied for a house, I was 107th on the list. And there was 147 people on that list for housing. Um, it's from single people to uh, elders, you know, or married couples or so uh, not enough, not enough. We, you can't build any more houses too because of this water system and the sewer system. So it's at its max, you know, like you can't even build houses because of the water and sewer system is too full. And who owns the houses? The community does, the, the community does 
and the people, um, they have a housing department and they, they even do lottery picks, uh, the people that apply. They just put them in a bowl and they pull out names. And say, okay, this is your house, pick a house. You're number one on the list. It's like a draft. Some people like you apply and you, uh, but single men are the last of the group. Uh, single parents with, uh, with children will be moved up on the list and they have a better chance of getting a house. Elders are the same way, but a single man is pretty much, uh, he won't get a house, they rarely get a house. So does that mean that the single men on the reserve live with other single men? Like no, nope, they stay with family members or they leave the community. Most of them leave the community though. Hmm. They live on the streets in Thunder Bay, they live on the streets in Toronto, so they're all over the place. It's like uh, they don't have a choice, right? There's nowhere to live. So they, they get into crime and then they leave the community, then they leave the, the uh, prison or the jails, and then they live on the streets after that, that I know of anyway. And if they wanted to move to another reserve that was run by a different band, would they be allowed to live there? And oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. But, but, but you run into the same thing, though, right? You run into the same same situation as you go north, because hmm. we have more houses than the north does. Because those other communities have 300 people to uh, 1,000 people. They don't have 1,500 like we do. We're one of the biggest communities up in Northern Ontario. Amazing. I don't think any of us had any idea that a, ho a housing shortage in the north basically forces people off the reserves down here. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes, yes. We've had people live in the bush too, like they don't want to leave the community. They live in the bush, they can't hold. And if, if uh, someone did want to build a house, they can't just build it on their own? Like, you know, no. the, government, the government won't allow you to have, there's so much stuff that holds you back from doing what you want to do. Since 1982, 1983, we are allowed to have lawyers to represent us in court. And that's just not even long ago. And I think you mentioned um, uh, about healthcare that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not straightforward. Could you guys explain why that is? I mean, here it's, you call your GP, you say, I want an appointment. It may take a week or two, but generally it happens pretty quickly. Uh, we have doctors that come up uh, about a week, uh, a week out of a month and they're booked up like uh, they take the highest cases that need to be seen to the lowest cases. So they're pretty booked up the whole two weeks and they work from eight o'clock, 8.30 to six o'clock I was told every day, even on weekends, for those two weeks. Um, a dentist is booked right from before they even get there. An eye doctor too will be booked. And they come about two times, three times a year for an eye doctor or a dentist to come, or even uh, dietitians and um, other people that uh, work with health. Even our um, mental health department, they, they take a while. And who, what level of government decides when these people come up? I don't know that part, I've never, I've never gone to that part like, uh, but um, but um, medical. But for me, it was it was hard. Like even going to 
to see a, a dietitian. It took me two months to see one. And they rarely come up to the community or they fly you to any appointment that you leave. Um, they fly you out to Winnipeg, Toronto, and Thunder Bay or in Sulacout. Most of the people go to Sulacout. And, there's and a, then they transfer you somewhere else. And there's a question in the chat. Do the dentists bring all their own equipment up? Like the chair, the... All the no, we have those. They just bring their own equipment, like stuff they use. Um, okay, other questions? Sorry, I've been hogging the, the, the line here. Um, just put up your hand, either really or... Okay, Wendy? Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, mute yourself there. Hi, um, I have some questions about um, the water, uh, and they they may appear s a stupid questions, but I. So the water that's being treated is it water that comes out of the lake? Yes. It okay, comes. and is it contaminated with animal and bird feces? Is that why, like there's E. coli, is that why it needs treating? No, it's just the bacteria that the people that come to check the water say it's not safe, so they put chlorine in it. And the amount of people that are in the community and the percentage of how much water goes into the community they put chlorine in there, so uh, it's just not drinkable. You can't drink that like right out of the tap. And you're saying that some people um, go in the bush and find water from springs. Yes, yes. And is this um, how uh, things would have been done um, by great grandparents and great great grandparents? That the water would have come from springs. Yes, or, yes. Or, or That's how we, I used to do it when I was living in the, when my grandparents out in the land, we used to go to fresh water. And would also have, in days gone past, would the grandparents have taken water from the lake and they, oh. were, they were just stronger and they didn't react to the bacteria? No, uh, you had to boil it. I mean, uh, even to bathe you, boil it. So I guess one of the things which I found uh, just a bit confusing is when you're in your home and you turn on the tap to the bath, say, water comes out, uh, which has lots of chlorine in it. Is that yeah. the one that has chlorine in it? And does the government expect you to drink that water? I guess, but I wouldn't drink it. So the water treatment plant, does it, it, it's working, but just no one wants to drink the water that's coming through that system? It's just not drinkable. I mean, you can do dishes and you can have a shower. Like you can't have long showers too, like because of the water, right? And it gives you some kind of rash sometimes, or it gives you some kind of I don't know how to describe it, but uh... can I can I chime in for a second? So my first year in the community, can you mute yourself? Sorry. <laughs> my first year in the community, so that was six years ago. Um, quite often, when I would turn the tap on, the water was very yellow, and uh, it it didn't have a nice a nice color to it, and it was. You know, I knew you couldn't drink it. Um, with the addition of the water treatment plant, I would say that the water is a lot clearer now when it comes through uh, through the tap. But it does have a very, very, very strong chlorinated um, feel to it. Um, you know, usually when I brush my teeth, I always use the the water that we get from the reverse osmosis. But sometimes I forget, and or I just get lazy. And definitely when you wake up in the morning, there's just like you can just taste like it doesn't. It doesn't taste good so um yeah so you do you either you boil your water and then you drink it or you buy your water which is you know can be sorry i had 
the spruce stuff? I don't actually know. I, I'm not on the full political end of, of that, but I know that uh, like Leo's brother-in-law is, is works for the water treatment plant and um, it's it's not it's not yet there in terms of being able to drink it. Thank you. Um, so two questions for people who have had their hands up. Uh, Jerry, you can go first and then Maura. Okay. First to Leo, I think you're quite amazing to have spent your childhood with your grandparents in the bush and then managed to survive the school system being whisked in there after two weeks. I find that totally amazing. Um, I'm kind of sickened by this uh, underbelly of what's going on up there, like you said, with the ring of fire, that um, because you're not all going along with the politics of it all, so now you find yourselves shoved back down lists and not getting services and things you need. So I would say, how do we help you with that? How do you make that more public? I mean, you'll have to unmute yourself, Leo. <clears throat> well, I think uh, it's doing stuff like this, educating people, educating what is going on up there and for community members to come down yeah. to Toronto, you know, leaving the community to help the community. And back in my great, great grandfather's day, they used to paddle all the way down or use dogs to come all the way down to talk to the government or to talk to people that would help or find ways to help because from where we are now, and where we were has been a big change. And it's because people leaving their community and saying, this is what I have to live with. You know, this is, this somebody's doing, right? Like me, like myself, I, I wanna advocate for my community. I wanna talk for them. I wanna do something. I want this generation that I watch grow up and go to high school, I mean, go to elementary school, now leave for high school. I want them to say, change, you know, let's make change, let's do change, you know. <clears throat> and at one point, or some point, it's gonna be violent. And that's the worst fear I have, you know, when it comes to violence and, and it just makes things worse. And that's what I tell the kids, you know, don't lead the violence, just educate, go to school, you know. The more education you have, the more opportunities you have. And, and um, with the government, you know, like you see other governments in all over the world, the people, the original people start using violence and yeah. start making wars and start hurting others. And that's the scary part. And I'm really scared for my grandkids and my, my kids to go in that direction. So uh, I, I like your idea about coming down more to talk to us because I'm never quite sure which level of government I'm aiming at, you know? So I've heard you say Ford on the road but I would assume the water scenario has to be the feds, right? And I know, God forbid, because um, we've all done so much injustice in our history here, but um, when I was talking to um, our Anglican organization, they were saying how they are trying to help is training um, the young people to be to to maintain the um the new water installations that are going into communities so they pay for it but then the young men have got jobs so 
you know, there are ways that we can we can try and help you. And and I think the more that we can get together, the more we can understand and the more we can lobby with you. So I I whatever we need to do to bring us together, I think that would be really, really helpful. I think it's also um, it, it's very it is very com confusing because there are multi levels of government, for example, yeah. education, it's a federal it's a federal yeah. um, level. Uh, but then other things are, as Leo was saying, it's provincial. So depending on which issue it is that you're yeah. you're after, it does yes. it does vary, and that makes it really hard. And so I think you know asking more questions and um, you know finding out which level it is that is addressing addressing the issues, which is all through education. I think that that is something that uh, you know going forward and having more people ask questions, ask their MPPs, and yeah. asking the MPs like what you know what can you know, what are they doing or, you know, looking yeah. into it a bit more because it can, it is very confusing for sure. Thank you. Um, Maura, um, your turn. Please unmute yourself though. Yeah. I've long been concerned with teenage suicide. Um, from time to time, the newspapers talk about it. And I've really learned a lot about, there's so many different aspects of of mental health in your communities and how many things are very depressing and, and how difficult it must be to maintain men, good mental health under those conditions. But in your, in your experience, as long as you've worked in that, in that area, have you seen teen suicides increase, decrease, or could you talk about that issue? You're both muted, so. <laughs> Hello. Yes, um, like I said, uh, the family home for uh, for uh, for suicide is that's where it all starts. Is the home, um, you know, residential school affected parents and grandparents. Then, in my my generation, it also affected because we were the kids that uh, you know it's a generational thing, and uh, for us it's normal to be put down, to be let down, to be you know in the low point. Um, it's normal, just like it is here, normal for people to go to school, people to do this and that. And once you teach the kids that, you know, it isn't normal, you know, it isn't right, it isn't, there is more for you. Um, it changes a kid, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do with, uh, with me now, Samira. But are you yeah. just the only lone voice doing that? Are you the only person there that has come back to the community and are trying to do this? Are there any other yous around there that are helping? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, good. Uh, good, good, good. I have my sister that used to be in council. She used to be a, a worker. I got uh, I got five brothers and, and two sisters, and we all worked in this field. And so your whole family is a is a is a <laughs> a going concern. Oh yeah, um, like um, <clears throat> justice of the peace. I mean, justice. Even one ah! of my brothers, my brothers works there. One of my brothers works in Thunder Bay. He works with uh, the high school. The same thing I do. Um, I have another brother that works in a school up in Moosney. I got another brother that works with. Uh, uh, with the police, uh, my sister just finished council. She was a council member for four years. I have my other sister that works with me at the school. You know, my mom was an emergency shelter for uh, foster kids or uh, kids in need. My dad was uh, 
one of the founders and board members for uh, Child and Family Services. He also was a counselor for 22 years in LA. And that's, uh, that's how my family is. It's like, that's all we've done is help the community. Well, well I'm very people. glad and proud to have met you. Congratulations. Yes, I remember Leo's met. Your family seems like a mini social services organization, basically. <laughs> or even like a mini ministry of social services, a government ministry of social services. <laughs> My sister said we should run a company. <laughs> uh, the next question is from uh, Judy Farwell. And, and I'm aware of uh, the time. We're getting pretty close to nine o'clock and we shouldn't tie um, Allison and Leo up forever. So that's well, okay. Two more it's questions. Not exactly a question. Um, there's so many people now um, being more aware of what's been happening and are so horrified and disgusted. But we still don't know about the conditions that are still continuing. We're aware of some of them. And um, I think it would help if we had get more involved with politics. Um, the Green Party is not ready to um, be the government of Canada, but they are a strong voice for the First Nation people and um, many other wrongs. And uh, they will um, influence changes. So that's one thing people can do. There's um, Indispire um, and other organizations that um, if you donate, they will help educate First Nation people. And um, I think it's your time. There's a lot more help going to be pouring in and people are going to be demanding changes. You're a very, very special group of people. And we need your um, customs. We need your knowledge if you can get it back. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, much. <clears throat> you and Allison. Um, the reason why we're talking about the residential school part is, you know, in my culture, in my community, the worst thing to happen is, is when a child is murdered, you know? And that's all we want people to recognize is that children were murdered. And that's, we're not talking about health. We're not talking about education. We're not talking about water. We're not the fact that children were murdered and that's and that's uh, and that's the main topic of why you're talking about residential school you know that's the worst act a human being can do in our culture anyways murder a child and that's why everybody's scared to say that part um but uh and I sat down with my grandfather. My grandfather said, it wasn't what they've done to the kids in the community, I mean, in the schools. It was what happened to us inside. What happened to us inside, my grandfather said, was the loneliness. The loneliness was the worst thing to us. He, she, he said, you know, when your child is taken away, from five years old, four years old to 16 when they were released to go home at 16. If your child was taken, it, it affected the brother, the sister, the auntie, the uncle, the grandparents, the parents, you know, the whole community. And that's what they're talking about. The effect it took you know, there's 1,500 of us in our community, but we're so close, it feels like there's only 100 of us. And when one child, when a child 
passes away in our community, it just brings down everything. Um, even a suicide of a teenager, stuff like that, you know, it just, we don't have two million people there where something is happening. You read about it. But when you're in a community, in a remote community, you have to live it, you have to be there. And I'm not saying everything is bad in the community. I mean, you get the freedom to go out, you know, live on the land, watch the animals, watch the trees, breathe in the tree, you know, like, it's so awesome when you're out there in the bush and, and then you go walking into, into the land and just, you just feel the life, you know, the air, it's just uh, the sun at night, you know, and the offering and the, the stuff that come to you to sustain your body, like the plants, the animals, you know, you know, that's how deep it gets when you live out in the bush, you know, and how, how you feel so free and happy. And for me, anyway, that's how I feel like it's just so, <clears throat> it's like, um, like when I dance at a power when I'm dancing, I'm telling a story. And that's what a power means. Power means for us to come together and tell our stories of what we're doing in our journey and our healing. So we help each other in that way and we come together. Um, religion was not a word in our in our culture it was religion was mm, a different thing for us you know you know most people ask me about powers and they ask me like why do you dance and i just tell them i'm there to tell a story about who i am where i've been what i do and that's what makes me proud of what i and most of the time, we're just telling stories about ourselves to help others when we go to powwows and what we do at powwows. Uh, the religious part, that word, is me going into the bush and praying and offering tobacco and smudging myself and praying for, uh, for good health and for uh, family members. And, whatever it is. When, uh, when we uh, got on the line about 10 or 15 minutes before most of you arrived, uh, Leo was teaching me a few words in Ojibwe. And one of the things he said was, we don't have a word for goodbye. So now that it's nine o'clock, <laughs> we're going to say so long. Hopefully we will see you again. And uh, miigwech. Thank you very, very much. I think everyone here has really felt like their eyes have been opened to a world that they barely understand and that we should understand a lot more about. So thank you so much for being here, um, both Allison and Leo. Um, and thank you, Rosemary and Alan, for suggesting that we do this. This was a wonderful idea. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. and. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of a relationship and maybe our community can, you know, help your community and vice versa. Um, so thank you very much for being here. And thank you all for coming. Miigwech to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miigwech. Leo, Allison. Thank you so thank much. You. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Come back, come back next year. <laughs> thank you, Leo. Thanks, Leo. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Leo. Allison. Thank you, Allison. And Allison, yeah. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Very generous of you to talk with us. Pardon? Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. Say hi. Hi. hi.
Hi, Auntie Di. <laughs> That was wonderful. <laughs> it was absolutely excellent. We're, we're on a tiny little cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations to you and Leo. And we hope to see you soon next week, maybe. Okay. Thank Love you, Lord. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was thank great. You. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Thank you, Leo and Allison. I really appreciate what you did. And Stephen, thank you for being such a gracious host. My pleasure. And for those of you who don't know, uh, so the Lawrence Park Community Church hosted this. We have a website that lists all of the activities we do every week. Um, so uh, if you wanna check us out, feel free to do so. Amanda, could you just put our um, website into the chat? lawrenceparkchurch.ca. Mm -hmm. But we have meditation classes during the week and uh, prayer services and every two weeks a hymn sing. Um, as well as things like this, social justice talks, and of course we do that Sunday morning thing too. Um, Stephen, I was going to say uh, if there, if anyone is interested in, you know, organizations that already work with our community, because we do have a, a number of different organizations that um, already come into the community or have ties with the community, <laughs> then I can. come in all the time, didn't you? We can. Uh, I can maybe send you some of the, the links uh, if people are interested uh, in connecting with those organizations to, to help out in, in different ways. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Please do. And how long are you downtown or like down in Toronto? <laughs> um, we're probably here until sometime in August. We're not exactly sure yet when we have to go back uh, to, to start school, but uh, probably first or second week of August, we'll be heading back. Okay, so if congregants have more questions, there's still time to ask. And I mean, you do you do have internet there, it's just not great. Yes, for people, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a question from Wendy in the chat. Uh, if the water ran out in times past, the grandparents would have moved, no? So do anyone in the community mm -hmm want to move away from the reserve? Is it just yeah. money to buy a house further south that stops people moving to more hospitable? Can feds just mm. give each family the money to buy a house where there's drinking water? No. No. <laughs> no, I think a lot of people, they, you know, that's their home and they don't want to, they don't want to move. Um, actually, Leo's mom, uh, said to me one time, right, you guys should build a cabin down by the point, which is part, you know, kind of where the old and new part of the community uh, were. And she's like, oh, but you wouldn't have running water, but that's okay. You don't, you don't need that. And so like, depending on the generation, um, some are very used to having no running water and some are, you know, the younger generation are, are very used to it. So, but they still don't, want to move right that's that's where they grew up and they have access to the lake and the land and hunting and living in yeah. living in the city is not not their preferred place right well cool well listen we're going to let you go but thank you so much for this this has been a real eye-opener for everybody and we really appreciate it thank you You're Leah welcome. for sharing your experiences I know that you feel like you're kind of an evangelist and you did a great <laughs> thank you Thank you. Um, um, I just want to say that um, I know if I offended anybody, I'm sorry, but thank you. Be good. I don't think you offended anyone. Don't worry about mm -hmm. that. All right. Good night, everyone. I'm going to shut us down. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night.